Why can't we apply to economic science Popper's demarcation criterion, according to which a scientific hypothesis is one that can be falsified through empirical testing? We discussed this the other day. There are four essential reasons, and I examine them in detail in the same order in my article Metodo y crisis en la ciencia económica. Let's consider the first reason. Do you recall what the object of study in economics is? Is it things or ideas? Ideas. The object of research in economics is ideas. The ideas the other human beings we study have about what they desire and what means they believe available to them to achieve what they desire, their ends. And these are not things we can observe directly in the outside world. Indeed, ideas cannot be directly observed in the outside world. Look around you. Do you see any ideas? Come on, let's do a lab experiment. Mark, look around you. Do you see any ideas? Let's all look. Do we see ideas? No. No one sees ideas. Ideas cannot be observed. They are not part of an indisputable outside reality that can be objectively studied in a laboratory. Positivists insist that history can be the laboratory, but they fall into a vicious circle because it's not possible to practice history without a prior theory. Ideas can't be observed. Ideas can only be interpreted, and to interpret them, we need a prior set of theoretical weapons, a prior theory. The theory must be formulated by methodological procedures other than empirical testing, or consulting reality to see if it confirms the theory or not. A chemical compound is a cosmetic. A piece of paper is money. A cosmetic is not a cosmetic due to qualities observable from the outside, but due to the use people believe the chemical compound has, that they can apply it at night to moisturize their skin and be more attractive. Also, they believe someone will accept that piece of paper as a medium of exchange, and they believe. When you hear me say the word rosa in Spanish, rose in English, you immediately know what I'm talking about. The idea occurs to you that I'm referring to a flower, incidentally a very lovely flower that smells really nice, but has thorns. If you didn't have that prior conceptual framework, if you had never heard a word of Spanish, for example, if Mark hadn't been born in Spain and had never studied Spanish, and he heard the word rosa, he wouldn't know what I'm referring to. But notice, all that is observable is what we hear, rosa, but it is a term, because we immediately identify what it conveys. If we didn't speak Spanish, we would think, how strange, Rosa, what is this? What does it mean? However, we do have an idea, and we immediately connect the sound with the flower. We have an idea, and the idea is the theory. I have the theory, the idea of a rose in my head, and I connect it with the term. So, dear students, the first reason we cannot apply to economics the method of empirical testing is our old friend, the fact that economics does not focus on things. It does not focus on tons of oil or millions of physical euros. Economics focuses on ideas. It is a science that focuses on spiritual realities. In economics, restrictions are not imposed by physical limitations from the outside world. One revolutionary idea is enough to do away with all those restrictions. The discovery of a carburetor that is twice as energy efficient is equivalent to the discovery of twice the supply of oil. At the end of the 19th century, there was a great outcry. The supply of coal is going to run out. What's going to happen? The world will come to a standstill. Chaos! Industry won't be able to... And what came of all that? Well, nothing. The internal combustion engine was discovered, and oil as well, as a new energy source. Not too many years ago, the Club of Rome was declaring, we are in the worst of worlds. Resources are going to run out. Nickel and copper have already disappeared, and agricultural capacity has been exhausted. People are going to go hungry. The Club of Rome members would get together and say, we need the UN, we need governments, we need to prepare ourselves, we need intervention. There was an Austrian economist, Julian Simon, may he rest in peace, who said, Oh yeah? Well, you're totally wrong, because economics is not about all those things that frighten you, 
restrictions from the outside world. Economics is about ideas. I'll make you a bet. I'll bet you that 20 years from now, the prices of all those resources you are so worried about will have dropped in real terms by a very large percentage, and furthermore, that the supply will increase, that the shortages you mention will not occur, and that instead there will be plenty. Everybody laughed at him, but he made the bet. 20 years passed, and he won. Everything people thought would be exhausted or limited was not in the end, and the world kept growing, thanks to entrepreneurial creativity, for it is ideas that drive the world. Economic science is about ideas, and the object of research in our discipline consists of ideas and entrepreneurial creativity. The second reason the method of empirical testing is not applicable to economics is that human action phenomena, which are what we study, are complex phenomena. They are complex phenomena that cannot be isolated. They do not lend themselves to laboratory experiments. In other words, in a laboratory, in physics or chemistry, you can freeze all the factors that influence a phenomenon, except one factor, and then you can see precisely what influence it has. In contrast, in economics, the laws we formulate are laws of tendency, or as we economists call them, ceteris paribus laws. Note that ceteris paribus is a Latin phrase which means other things being equal. So, laws in economics are expressed as follows. Other things being equal, ceteris paribus, an increase in demand tends to drive up the price. Well, what I'm saying is that in the real world, no one is able to observe anything ceteris paribus. In history, we can't say ceteris paribus, or in other words, hey, one moment, everybody out there in the world, freeze, and everybody suddenly stops dead. Nobody think anything new. Nobody discover anything. Nobody change their tastes. No discovering any new sources of supply. No implementing any new innovations. Everybody just stand still. And humanity comes to a halt. Except, shh, everybody freeze. Except, let there be an increase in the supply of potatoes in Ireland. And let's see what happens to the price. It's not possible to conduct laboratory experiments in the world. There is no phenomenon we can observe, ceteris paribus, in the world. Out in the world we cannot isolate just two factors and leave the rest frozen and unalterable. This means that the phenomena we study are complex phenomena. The phenomena that comprise history are complex phenomena that cannot be isolated. They do not lend themselves to laboratory experiments. In the real world, no scientist has ever been able to observe anything ceteris paribus, other things being equal, nor can any scientist do so now, nor will any ever be able to do so in the future. So, we cannot test ceteris paribus laws in a constantly changing world, in a world we cannot freeze. This is the second reason the method of empirical testing is not applicable to economics. You cannot logically derive a law that states that other things being equal, an increase in demand tends to drive up the price, and then say, OK, let's empirically test this law in the real world. To test that law in the real world, you would have to be able to freeze the whole world, every human being, and make sure nobody discovered anything nor created anything new. And you would have to isolate only two phenomena and then observe whether an increase in demand was followed by an increase in price. Such a thing is not possible. I repeat, the research process in economics is the other way round. We begin by deducing a law in purely theoretical theoretical terms, and then, with that law, we can dare to bring order to the huge mass of apparently unconnected events that make up history. And we can begin to grasp in historical terms a little of the world around us. Of course, from the time we're small, human beings have to interpret history, because we're lost if we don't. And as children, we didn't come to economics class, nor had we read Human Action, nor Professor Huerta de Soto's books nor had we taken the course. We shouldn't be surprised by the amount of nonsense we hear. As I was saying before, the great majority of our notions about what happens in the world are false, because the interpretive framework we either explicitly or implicitly use is, for the most part, very poor or erroneous.